Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Development of Vascular Access Port Model in Woodchucks. I'm Robert Castellanos of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is a leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars, contributing to the advancements of science through content sharing capabilities. LabRoots is a powerful advocate in amplifying global networks and communities. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If any technical problems hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button, lower left. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Margaret, or rather her preferred name, Peg Batchelder. Dr. Peg Batchelder has achieved her veterinary degree in 1987 and a board certification in laboratory animal medicine in 1997. Her veterinary experience has included private pet practice, academic research, pharmaceutical research. She has contributed both as a laboratory animal veterinarian and as a researcher. Currently, she works for Bristol Myers as a principal veterinary scientist. Her role includes serves on the Animal Care Use Committee as attending veterinarian, providing clinical care of research animals, collaborating with researchers, developing surgical animal models, and overseeing the Animal Health Assurance Program. I'll now turn it over to the doctor for her presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. I'm very happy to be presenting on my favorite animal, the woodchuck. And I don't know whether any of you have had experience with woodchucks or if you've had experience with vascular access ports or VAPs, as I'm going to call them. Um, but I'm hoping that the experience that we had putting VAPs into woodchucks will be uh, give you something useful to take home uh, for the future, or at least be interesting. Um, before I get into the technical details of the, of the procedure, I would like to just give a quick background on vascular access ports and on woodchucks and why we might want to put vascular access ports in woodchucks. So a vascular access port is a way to access the circulatory system by placing a cannula in a vessel that runs to a, a port which is under the skin, so it's completely implanted and uh, can be uh, pierced with a needle percutaneously. So it's completely enclosed under the skin, nothing's hanging out to get infected, and they can last quite a long time um, in people. Um, you know, they can last for years. They were originally designed for people who were getting frequent chemotherapy, so they didn't have to keep poking veins. And in research, it's been used um, in research animals when they need to have a lot of blood samples uh, or blood dosing, and you can put the port you know, wherever you want to put it in a convenient site, so sometimes that's helpful as well. It's considered a refinement in animal research uh, because if there are a lot of blood samples taken, it's overall less stressful for the animal to have one surgery than it is to have many, many uh, blood draws. Use of vascular access ports has been reported in many species. Uh, you can see the list here. Uh, this is both clinical uses and research uses. Um, if you are considering placing a vascular access port, you do have to weigh the risk of the anesthesia and surgery uh, potential surgery complications versus the benefits of the reduced handling and stress on the animal after the port's been implanted. And again, it's really a matter of you know, how much use you're gonna get out of that port, whether it weighs in the balance of in favor of using the port. Um, woodchucks, a little background. Uh, woodchucks are native to the eastern and northern parts of North America, so the United States and Canada primarily. Uh, the name comes from the Native American Wuchak, 
Uh, so woodchuck, uh, they're also called groundhogs, whistle pigs, and land beavers for those who, those who are a little challenged in identifying their species. Uh, within the U.S., uh, they're mostly considered a pest because they like to eat gardens. They are quite large. Uh, they can weigh up to 15 pounds or 6 kilograms. Uh, that depends partly on their weight and partly on their metabolic state because they are a hibernating species. So they can lose quite a bit of weight over the winter when they're hibernating and then gain quite a bit in the summer. They have a stocky body, short legs and a tail, and they're very strong forelimbs and long, sharp claws, uh, which they use to dig the burrows that they live in. Woodchucks are, uh, the species of woodchuck is susceptible to infection with woodchuck hepatitis virus, which is actually endemic in some subpopulations. Woodchuck hepatitis virus is very similar both in structure and in epidemiology and disease as human hepatitis B virus, and that is what makes the woodchuck such a valuable model. Uh, hepatitis B virus can cause a number of different diseases. Uh, it could be asymptomatic. It can be an acute or chronic hepatitis. Um, if it becomes in a chronic state, it can lead to cirrhosis and eventually uh, can lead to liver cancer. Uh, and so this is a really important disease worldwide, and the um, research that's being done in woodchucks is helping to develop therapeutics either to prevent the infection or to try to alter the chronic state so the immune system is enabled to actually clear the virus to prevent that chronic disease, cirrhosis, liver failure, and cancer. Uh, this is, uh, the upper picture is a human hepatocellular carcinoma, and the lower one is uh, multiple carcinomas from a woodchuck. So woodchucks are an uncommon lab species. Uh, there are very few places that actually will breed them for research use. Um, as I said, they're considered a pest, so uh, people don't usually keep them as pets. Uh, there is some information in the literature, but not a whole lot. So when we knew we were getting woodchucks in, uh, we learned as much as we could and then got them in and learned a whole lot more just by experience. Woodchucks, uh, when they're in their cages, really appear quite docile, but they can be aggressive, especially if they're wild caught, uh, especially uh, if you are trying to approach them and they're scared and they can cause serious bite and scratch wounds with those big claws and their big rodent teeth. Because their bodies are short and thick and their legs are short, the tail is short, uh, they're hard to hold on to. The skin is very mobile, so they can kind of twist around inside, the, inside their skin because there's a very thick layer of subcutaneous fat. Uh, if you pick them up by the tail, they can actually climb up their own tail, um, and they're very strong. If they get hold of something while you're holding them, they can pull or push, um, and their, for, their forelegs are very strong. So in most cases, if you want to do anything with a woodchuck in the lab, you're going to have to anesthetize it. So as you can imagine, um, if you are doing multiple blood draws, that's a lot of anesthesias. Um, and that's what our studies involved. We needed to dose intravenously, and we also had to take a lot of blood samples. So we felt that it it was worth the risk of putting the animal through a longer, uh, longer anesthesia, the risks of surgery, in order to allow us to take blood samples without having to anesthetize them every time. And it's also less time consuming if you don't have to anesthetize them because it does take them a while to, to go down. Uh, it also uh, allows, uh, the, uh, we created a restrainer which allows woodchuck to be restrained with more safety to the handler, and I'll show you a picture of that in a couple of minutes. Um, when you are placing a VAP, there are different vessels that you can place it in, uh, place the cannula in. We talked with other people who had placed uh, VAPs in woodchucks, and primarily they either used the femoral vessels in the hind leg or they uh, use the what 
is commonly called the jugular vein, but actually it's the anastomosis between the lingual, facial, and maxillary veins under the jaw, uh, but it's a lot easier to say jugular. And um, we looked at both methods. We were most experienced with doing femoral vessel VAPs uh, in other species. We had done dogs and macaques and marmosets. So um, that was one of the reasons we decided to go with the femoral. A couple of other reasons. One is uh, that that was closer to the back end of the animal rather than the front end of the animal where the teeth are. So that would allow us to put the port a little farther away from danger. And it also was very easy to just grab the woodchuck by the tail and kind of lift it halfway up and you could see the incision site um, during the post-operative period. It was very easy to, to check on that as opposed to trying to look under the animal's neck. On some of the animals, we implanted both arterial and venous in the same leg. Uh, other animals just had arterial ports. The animals that we had, were, we had quite a variety, very eclectic group. And uh, we had both sexes. We had various ages, and these ages were often unknown. Uh, they were wild caught. And some were infected with Wichuk hepatitis virus, and some were not. The infected ones, for the most part, had a confirmed chronic infection, so they were not in the acute stage. Um, the wild-caught ones were, were caught from an endemic wild populations. Some were delivered directly to us from trapping. Some were taken to the vendor's facility where he um, would condition them, worm them, treat them, kind of get them through uh, being used to captivity, and then sell them back to us for a large amount of money. He also would take any mothers that were pregnant when they were trapped um, and have them give birth in his facility, and he could infect the pups by injecting the woodchuck hepatitis virus, and that gives a higher rate of infection than just a natural infection. And, of course, everything we did was um, approved by our Animal Care and Use Committee. The port that we actually used was this uh, Access Technologies clear port. Uh, we, again, it's something that we'd used before. Uh, the port heads were pre-attached, so we didn't have to you know, put them on the lines. So this is how we worked out um, preparing the animals. Uh, before surgery, we gave them a pre-surgical anesthetic, um, so we had that on board. Uh, if a woodchuck was hepatitis positive, they would get a vitamin K injection. Um, I was going to mention that later as well. They, because they could have hepatitis, they might have a decreased ability to clot. So we just wanted to give them that little extra boost in case their clotting factors were a little bit low. Um, we fasted them overnight, although if they were scheduled to have surgery in the afternoon, we would just fast them that early that morning. Um, the animals were induced by either an inhalant anesthetic, just as you saw in the other picture, or by injectable anesthetic agents. And we placed a cephalic IV catheter in all the woodchucks and put them on intraoperative fluids to help support them. Um, anesthetic maintenance was by isophorine. It was either uh, given through a face mask or we were able to intubate some of the animals, and I'll talk about that more later. If they were on a face mask, we had a vacuum system that was near the head of the animal to exhaust the leaked anesthetic gases, so uh, the surgeons did not become anesthetized. We gave them a broad-spectrum antibiotic, and we also gave uh, dupinorphine SR, which is a long-acting uh, long analgesic. In other species, it's supposed to last up to three days, uh, so we felt that hopefully in this species it would as well. And we kind of played around with the dose, uh, started with rat doses and, and dog doses and kind of worked in between. Um, if the dose was, was a little too high, it, it made them go very deep in anesthesia, so it was interacting with the anesthetics. So uh, we kind of tw twiddled around with the dose and, until we ended up with this um, 0.5 mg per keg, and that worked really well. Uh, we did check their blood glucose before surgery, and if, they were, if it was low, we would put a little glucose into the fluids. The fluids were warmed. 
the body temperature was maintained by heating um, plates underneath the surgery drapes, and uh, they were uh, it was also monitored throughout surgery. Um, as well as body temperature, we monitored the respiratory rate, the heart rate, uh, the oxygen saturation of the blood, and if the animals were intubated, we could also monitor end tidal CO2. Um, the picture here is one that's on a face mask, um, but some of the animals we were able to intubate, and then we could do that monitoring as well. Uh, a normal surgical prep of the surgical site, which is the inside of the, the hind leg. Uh, obviously used sterile technique throughout the surgery, just with any other species. Uh, we would make an incision, find the vessels, um, and use uh, blunt dissection to free up the vessels from the surrounding tissues. The head of the VAP, which is the, the port or head of the VAP, is where the needle's going to go in. Um, needed to be placed on the top of the animal as opposed to underneath. So we would then flip the animal over and make an incision over the wing of the ilium and made a little subcutaneous pocket put put the ports in. This, is, this illustration here has two, so this is an arterial and a venous. Um, we would be consistent about which was in front and which was behind so that we always knew which one to hit depending on what we wanted to do. Uh, then you would, we would use a trocar to pass the cannulas down to the incision area in the, in the inguinal area so that they would be um, able to thread into the vessels. At that point, we would go ahead and anchor the port head to the muscle. There's holes in the, in the metal head to put suture through, uh, and then we would um, close up that incision, flip the animal back over, and we'd be back in the inguinal area. And to cannulate the vessels, we would tie off distally, um, temporarily clamp off with an atraumatic vascular clamp, or we could just put some suture around it and lift it so that it cut off the blood supply temporarily. <clears throat> Used very fine scissors to make a, a little cut in the vessel wall, and then we're able to pass the cannula into the vessel. Um, for most of us, uh, we like to use magnifying loops to do this. If you have really good eyesight, you can do it just with your regular eyesight. Um, once the catheter or the cannula is in place, it's ligated into place, and then someone on the other side of the animal will reach over to the uh, port heads, put the needles in the port heads, and flush through the cannulas to make sure um, both in and out that the blood will flow freely in your if your ligatures are too tight, um, you may have to loosen them up a little because they can actually crush, crush the cannula. So you kind of get a feel for it after you've done a few. Our incisions were closed in two layers, uh, a subcutaneous layer and uh, a subcuticular incision, uh, enclosure for the skin. We used uh, absorbable suture, and by using the um, subcuticular closure, we did not have to take any skin sutures out later, which you know was that much less handling for the woodchuck. And then we would flush the vaps one last time, make sure they still worked, and then lock them with a uh, lock solution, which we used um, TCS. So after surgery, um, these animals tended to wake up quite quickly, which is, was nice. They didn't stay asleep really long once you've discontinued the anesthesia. Uh, woodchucks are pretty easy to dose orally, so we did continue the antibiotics uh, with uh, oral solution. We got a compounded solution of enrofloxacin that was a high concentration, so the volume was pretty small. Um, but the, they are easy to, to dose with a feeding needle. You just have to get behind those big front teeth and into their mouth, and they will take it quite readily. Based on experience with other species and reports, we did expect the buprenorphine SR to provide at least three days of analgesia. Uh, we didn't really have any way to test it, but I will say we never saw any animals that looked like they were in pain. 
So uh, I think it worked. <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell with a woodchuck because they mostly just sit there. So we we had done, you know, what I've described is pretty similar to what we'd done in other species, but there were some special considerations that we learned along the way for this uh, particular species. One is that subcutaneous fat. I mentioned before they have a large layer of subcutaneous fat, and that's so they can store lots and lots of fat to go into hibernation. So even, even in the wintertime when they're at a low metabolic state, they still have that fat layer. And in many cases, um, you could not reach the muscle layer to suture your port heads down unless you removed some of the fat. So we actually had to do lipectomies or fatectomies um, so that you could get down to where the muscle sheaths were that would hold the sutures on the port head. Otherwise, the port heads would have just kind of floated around in that fat and, and not been able to be um, pierced as easily. In other species, we had placed the port head up um, on the paraspinal area uh, on the back, uh, more towards the center of the back, and the width of the paraspinal area was the correct size so that the port head would fit on it. Um, in the case of the woodchucks, they did not have a very wide paraspinal area, um, and they also had a very... Um, I, won't, I don't know if it's thin or what you would say, but the, the abdominal wall is kind of floppy. So there wasn't a lot of support for the port head. And if you don't have support and you're trying to put a needle in, it's just going to squish down into the, into the body. So we located the port heads on an area over the wing of the ilium so that the bone, the ilium bone, would provide support for the ports and we could push against that bone when we were putting the needles in. So that was that was a little bit new. Uh, some other special considerations. Um, woodchucks, apparently, uh, because they are a hibernatory species, they have quite a bit of variation in body weight, as I mentioned, seasonally, um, blood glucose, body temperature, respiratory rate, um, very wide variations, and. It, it did vary a little bit with season as well because in the off, in the winter season, even though they did not actually hibernate in the lab, they do go through a period of lowered m metabolism. So the body weight would vary with season. The blood glucose sometimes was quite lie, high or it could be quite low. Uh, as I mentioned, we would supplement if it was low, but having a blood glucose, glucose over 200 was not necessarily a problem. Uh, body temperature as well uh, could be lower than it, than you would expect in an in a animal. You would expect them to be about 37 degrees centigrade, and they could drop quite low to the point where in another species we might be concerned, but these guys tolerated it very well, and I think, again, it's because they do drop their body temperature during hibernation. Their respiratory rate could be very slow, uh, it was not unusual to have a respiratory rate of four to six breaths per minute. So sometimes you're just sitting there watching them, for, watching them to take that next breath. And I mentioned that they could be challenging to intubate. We intubated when we could. Um, their mouth opening is very small. They have flaps behind their front teeth that keep the dirt out when they're tunneling. Uh, and the, the huge incisors kind of get in the way of anything. Uh, elongated, narrow oral cavity. And um, we did try to use rabbit uh, blades on our laryngoscope, and they were not really long enough. We even went so far as to have a special blade designed and made using a 3D printer. And then we found out that the focal point of the laryngoscope light didn't align with the back of the animal's mouth. So it kind of didn't light where we where it needed to light. So we just um, mostly intubated by uh, by feel and just by what, what we could see beyond the teeth with our eyes. We didn't try more than two times to intubate an animal uh, because we found that if you uh, kept pushing it, they would uh, have a very um, they have a very sensitive airway which would swell up and could cause some obstruction. So we were very careful not to overdo it and went to the mask if 
we weren't able to get the uh, tube in. There was also a concern about their lung capacity because they have a huge abdomen full of guts that digest all the food that they have to eat. Uh, their thorax is relatively small, and so uh, we had to do things such as tilting the table down so that the weight of their gut contents wasn't pressing on the diaphragm. Um, in some cases, they actually uh, saw some abdominal distension during surgery or during induction of anesthesia. We think it might have been diet-related if they'd had cabbage or something like that, um, but for some reason they would just start to inflate, and we immediately had to take them off the anesthesia and reschedule because uh, that could put so much pressure on the diaphragm that they would have difficulty breathing. Uh, only happened a couple of times, but it was quite striking when it did. I mentioned that the infected animals could have compromised liver function, so that can affect their glucose as well as uh, their clotting ability, so we did pre-treat them with the vitamin K. Um, once they have gone through the surgery and, and are all healed, uh, then you have to um, check the VAP on a regular basis if it's being used. Obviously, you're checking it while you're using it. If it's in between studies, uh, we would check them at least uh, every two weeks. Um, they, they were placed on the back end of the animal, and that was so that we could access them easily. When the animal was awake, by using a custom-built restrainer. So I'll show you a picture here. So the restrainer is um, just basically a tube. It's about half the length of the animal. So the head with those big, long teeth and those big, strong forelimbs with the claws on them are well contained within the tube, but the back end is out so that we can uh, access the ports. It's hard to see the ports in this photo, but the arrowheads are pointing to, uh, there are two ports there. Um, as you can imagine, just as a side note, because these animals do have a lot of fat, you often have to find the port heads by feeling them rather than looking. They kind of get buried. Um, th for this uh, setup, we would put the animal on the floor, would be let out of its box, it's carried in a box, we let them out on the floor or in a big box on the floor, grab them by the tail, flip them up quickly on the table, and then with the gloved hand, guide them into the tube. And then you use the gloved hand to kind of hold the hindquarters so they don't back out. Um, they do feel more secure in the tube. They generally do not uh, twist around and try to escape once they're in there. They remain fairly calm. And at the same time, your handlers, both the woodchuck handler and the person taking the samples, uh, are protected from bites and scratches. Everything that we did with the VAPs was done in a sterile fashion. Uh, we would shave if we had to. Uh, we found out that woodchucks don't grow their hair back all the time. Uh, they tend to have one or two seasons of the year where they grow hair, and the rest of the time, if you shave it off, it doesn't grow back. So we often did not have to shave the hair. We just had to do a surgical scrub of the skin. Um, then using sterile technique, we would pierce percutaneously into the port head um, using a Huber needle. A Huber needle is uh, what they call a non-coring needle because of the way the tip is angled it will not cut a round hole in the uh, membrane of the port head. Um, it just kind of slips through without taking any pieces out with it. That way you can use the port head multiple times. And this is the picture of uh, you know, one person restraining the woodchuck and the other is withdrawing blood or flushing. It's going one way or the other with the syringe. You can see the sterile table laid out there. And um, it was uh, fairly, fairly easy to do, and the uh, woodchucks did just fine. We had pretty good success with the ports. Um, we had, well, all together we had implanted 70 animals. Uh, they all had an arterial port and 
48 of them had both arterial and venous ports. Uh, they were, um, you know, I've got statistics here. They were functional for, most of them were functional for at least 60 days, which was, you know, good enough to get them through a study. Um, many were still functional after six months. And keep in mind that within that six months, some of those animals might have been euthanized while the ports were still working at the end of a study. So the actual percentage could even be higher than that. And then overall, 60% um, of the VAPs were still functional at the time that the animal was, was euthanized or donated. The longest duration that we had was, was one girl who had a arterial and venous VAPs. Both of them stayed patent up to 703 days, at which point she was donated. So who knows how long it would have gone. So I just want to give uh, some acknowledgments to some of the other people who were very instrumental in this whole process. Um, at Bristol Myers Squibb, Heidi Dulac, Gary Marks, uh, he was our woodchuck wrangler. Um, Kelly Walton was another veterinarian. Um, both she and Heidi could do the surgeries as well as myself. Um, Sharon Aborn was another person who had been trained to do the surgeries and she did a lot of the anesthesia. And James Brennan was our alternative woodchuck wrangler. At Roswell Park Cancer Institute, we went and visited them before we got our woodchucks in and got a ton of information from Sandra Sexton. She was very helpful um, in sharing the information about their woodchuck colony, and uh, we did definitely appreciate it. So um, I know I kind of went through that quickly. I wanted to be sure we had plenty of time for questions. Uh, I can go back to any slide you might want me to go back to or um, just ask questions as you wish. I see there's a couple up there. Well, thank you, Doctor, for that informative presentation. And yes, um, we'll get started on that question and answer session. But before we do, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And like the doctor said, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is, what is the major disadvantage of VAPs? Um, is that clotting or contamination? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Not a problem. What is the major disadvantage of VAPs? Is that clotting or contamination? Um, in our hands, the major problem was clotting. Um, we, I'm, I'm thinking if we ever even had one that got infected. Um, we have had occasional infections in other species, but I don't think any of our woodchucks ever did end up with an infected port. Um, so the main reason that they would fail would be from the clotting or kinking. Sometimes the tubes would, yeah, cannulas would get kinked. Right. Our next question is, oh, I'm so sorry, were you still needing? Oh, I was just going to mention in passing that sometimes we would um, flush the lines with um, a agent, I um, can't remember what it was, an, a radio opaque agent so that we could see what the lines were doing. And we could see, you know, maybe they'd pulled out of the vessel and the agent was just going under the skin. Um, so there were ways that we could kind of take a look at them. Thank you. And our next question is, did you see any injection site reaction with a Bubertin Orphan SR? Um, we had some problems using that in mice. Yes, I've heard about those problems in, in mice and rats. Um, we did not see any problems at all. Um, I don't know whether that's because the woodchucks are immune to having that kind of problem or just because you know, when you give a sub-Q injection in a woodchuck, there's a huge space between the skin and the body wall for it to go. So you could have had a reaction under the skin, and we would never have been aware. But we did not see anything um, or feel any bumps that were a problem. Our next question is kind of leads into this. What kind of complications did you see with surgery? Well, there were a few. Um, the most distressing for us was anesthetic death. Um, that happened 
a number of times. The first first time it happened, we were that we reviewed all of our surgery procedures, and that was when we had decided to tip the table up, and um, we kind of changed the order that we did things for the surgery to make it go a little quicker, um, but. We have to keep in mind that some of these were wild-caught animals, and uh, they could have other problems. Um, woodchucks can get heart disease, and the ones that I necropsy did in some cases appear to have enlarged hearts. Um, they could have other diseases. Uh, we had a woodchuck die, not on the table, but it, it died of uh, renal failure. Uh, another one had a big abscess in her abdomen that we didn't even know was there until it ruptured. And so they can be carrying other complicating factors that you're not aware of. Um, but they can go uh, quite quickly. You can be watching for that one breath every 15 seconds, and then it's late, and then the next thing you know, the animal was gone. So that was kind of the most distressing complication and the hardest one to try to avoid. Um, you know, we did everything we possibly could think of to, to not have that happen. Uh, we did not have a major, any major problems with infection. Um, the incisions, even though they're underneath the animal and down in the bedding, um, seemed to stay pretty clean. The animals would leave them alone. Uh, we did have one animal that had developed a hematoma, uh, but that uh, resolved just with conservative treatment. So um, not a whole lot of complications. Well, thank you. Uh, so you've mentioned here um, that you, some of your animals that you caught um, were wild caught. Did you have any issues with pre-existing health conditions, and were you concerned about rabies? Yeah. Um, well, I just mentioned a couple of pre-existing health conditions. The, um, the kidney failure had come on. I mean, we were monitoring their blood work all along, so... When her BUN and creatinine started going up, just like in any other animal, we kept an eye on her, and, and she did have spontaneous kidney failure. And we had the one with the abscess uh, that that turned up as a sudden death, unexpected. But when we opened her up, there was what I would have sworn was a hemangiosarcoma. It was huge, full of pockets of blood, and one of those pockets had just ruptured. So at some point in her life in the wild, she had gotten a kidney infection. Um, many of them came in with wounds or scars from wounds. Um, one had an injury to the eye and had entropion, so we did surgery on the eyelid to try to reduce that entropion effect on the eye. Um, and, you know, they could have missing teeth or claws. Um, some of them came in with a pododermatitis, um, sores on the bottoms of the feet, which were very difficult to treat. Um, usually if that happened after we received them, we would catch it quickly and they would be curable, but the ones that came in with it, it was generally already chronic and difficult to treat. Those are the, probably the main things. Well, thank you. Um, before we wrap up today, do you have any closing remarks for us? Um, well, I just... Uh, I want to say I, I really love the species. It was very interesting and exciting to have them in the lab. I'm sorry we don't have them anymore. Um, as I mentioned before, there's not a whole lot of information out there, but it's really good to get to know people who've had them or who have them and talk with them and get information firsthand. Um, again, I'm, I went to Roswell Cancer Institute, and Sandra was very helpful, and I would be helpful uh, glad to be helpful to anybody who gets woodchucks in the future. Well, again, Doctor, thank you very much for your time and that outstanding presentation. I'd also like to thank Labroots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May 2017. You'll receive an email from Labroots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event, and goodbye. <laughs>